Hello everybody, this is Verdict, also known as The Classic Pally, and thank you so, so much for stopping by to check this video. Now, on this channel, we nerd all about Rhett and Prot in World of Warcraft Classic and going further into the Burning Crusade. So if you think that this content would be quite, quite a thing for you, then please hit that subscribe button and share, like the video so you get the entire deal. Also, I do have a Theory Crafting Discord, which has uh, spiked over 100 members, so if you care enough to take your ret or a prod to the next level then please do check that out so without further ado let me just take you into what this video is all about so world of warcraft classic recap what does this really mean uh, well what i want to really share with you guys is the journey and and what happened what really came to be of the protection and the retribution paladins. So, um, for the sakes of this video, I will not mention holy paladins, simply because, well, holy paladins are, well, holy paladins, they're always optimal, they're always, at the very least, viable, depending on the on the, on the the fight, of course, and there's no reason to, to, to mention them. They were pretty much top tier. You don't need to talk too much about them. It's, it's known, but uh, let's first and foremost start with protection paladins, and we're going to talk about this uh, phase-wise, because um, in order for you to get an understanding of what and when happened, we need to locate that inside of a phase. So we're going to start, obviously, from being a level 60 protection paladin. So what happened? Well, during the leveling process of the paladins, a few members, really prominent members of uh, the protection paladin community, actually found out that uh, Blessings of Kings could generate threat. And we all know the story, we've seen what that really does, but for the people who don't know, uh, what Blessings of Kings happened to do was generate a really small amount of threat, but at the very same time, it would be uh, increased by our Righteous Fury spell. Not just that, if you use the Greater Blessings of Kings, then that threat is being spammed for every member who you're buffing with. So if you have 10 warriors, that would deal threat 10 times more instead of what it does. And not just that, it would be increased by 90% if you have Righteous Fury active. So this really solidified viability threat-wise for uh, the Protection Paladins. So... Upon them being us, really, upon us uh, being level 60, uh, there was a few things that were still uncertain, because even though Greater Blessings of King spam for threat was actually quite sustainable, um, it still proved to be a mana issue if the fight is really prolonged. It, if the fight would exceed two minutes, then it wouldn't be really a thing that the Paladin can just sustain. So with that being said, at level 60, there were a lot of questions which were answered uh, while the progression of the phases uh, unleashed phase by phase. So let's talk first and foremost about phase one and that would be dungeons and molten core. Now, dungeon-wise, Paladins are absolutely fine. Uh, the base damage of the Paladins is, is good enough for them to be, uh, you know, viable. But outside of that, for raids, Paladins really really became almost top tier. And I really want to emphasize on almost top tier. And I'll tell you why in a bit. See, the base threat of the things which are which is in WoW Classic, especially for Paladins, is high. Paladins, base-wise, threat-wise, are they're really good. Of course, obviously taking Greater Blessings of Kings under consideration. It's just that the base of it is so strong to the point where a Paladin would out-threat a warrior if he has, let's just say, eight plus warriors. Then a warrior can never hope to get uh, is remotely close to the threat of the Paladin. But that would be only if all of these warriors were. Uh, were alive, and of course, for progression, it wasn't really the best mindset. You know, hope that everybody is going to be alive so that you could tank as a protection paladin. So, following that train of thought, to, to just summarize it, in phase one, in Molten Core, and we're going to talk about an in a bit, Molten Core paladins would just prove to be the kings of threat, undisputed kings of threat. It would be so good to have a protection paladin just because um, a paladin uses a shield and still dishes so much threat, which would make paladins, protection paladins, more tankier than protection warriors, because if a warrior is to compete with a paladin on threat, he would need to dual wield. So you get the idea. It would be a really interesting, um, it, it would be a really interesting moment where you would see a warrior struggling to out threat to Paladin, and not, so, not just struggling, totally unable to do it, unless obviously it's a taunt fight and he could do that. And not just that, even if a taunt would be, uh, would, would just drop, which is just 
by a few seconds, the, the target would switch back to the Paladin just because of how much threat he does. So with that being said, Phase 1 Molten Core Paladins would be incredibly good. They would be able to tank every single mob inside inside Molten Core, every single boss inside Molten Core, maybe uh, with a few exceptions. That would be Baron Geddon because he drains mana and it's really a spell intensive fight, which uh, Warriors so happen to be the best in. And overall speaking, Paladins could even tank Ragnaros without any issues, not just tank it, but also also sustain the fight even though it's a slightly longer fight it could it could still be done so with that being said uh, we moved to Anixia and Anixia was the first time where uh, protection paladins really started to shine because uh, second phase is Anixia for almost every single raid was absolute chaos I mean sorry third phase the moment she drops down she she swipes the entire raid like she she was just a mess and the best way for you to deal with that would be to just simply get a paladin to spam blessings of kings while she is up there and the moment she drops if she hasn't hit him with a fireball which the paladin should be able to uh, to handle alone then it would be straight under the paladin and you kill the fight and it's going to be a hundred percent easier than just you know let onyxia run rampant through the entire raid so overall this was the first time where paladins were solidified dare i say as a viable tank as viable tank so we uh, talked about phase one. This was really what happened. So phase two, we don't need to mention it. It's just a dungeon release, nothing really too big, except of course PvP coming into the game. Overall speaking, uh, most of the paladins which I saw were going for uh, rank ten, just so they would get the spell damage set, and because it has good stamina numbers, has good spell damage numbers. So phase one, we would see that happen. Uh, sorry, phase two, we would see that happen, and then we move over to phase three and phase three of course being blackwing claire so in blackwing claire paladins were still as good as they were now bear in mind if we are to compare a molten core geared paladin to a molten core geared uh warrior then damage wise uh warrior would deal more damage or warrior would be tankier in, in blackwing claire but at the very same time uh you know, threat and tankiness are kind of compromising one one another. And the Paladin still didn't have that issue. The Paladin would still dish more threat than what the Warrior could possibly imagine. And Paladins would still be the kings of threat throughout Blackwing Claire. Talking even about the incredible Vialstris where I myself pull threat away from my fellow warriors in the guild. So you would see that being quite a funny thing, especially for a fight such as Vialstris. So overall speaking, Paladins were still incredibly good, not to mention Stylings is there, Judgment is there as a set piece. Um, a lot of the things which you lacked in terms of defense, because you are a Paladin, there are no tank items for you, you really made up with these pieces. And overall speaking, Paladins and Black and Claire were really, really happy. Not to mention, I know a few Paladins with Thunder Fury, and they say that that was so so good to get that you know even though i myself had it a long ago on private servers um it was it was better over here than what it was on private servers in terms of feeling so with that being said we're going to go into the interesting part of the journey of the protection paladins which hit uh with the zulgarub release which was i think it was phase four yes it was phase four so zulgarub was an interesting uh, was an interesting thing see you can only imagine that you wouldn't be able to tank uh as, as adequately as you would think if you didn't have enough members to greet your blessing of king spam right so many paladins were really okay we won't be able to tank 20 men so we might as well just go there and heal and this playstyle was developed where, you know, in Zulgarub things don't deal that much damage for you to care about avoidance. You could just simply respec into Holy, get the Holy Shock ability, move everything down to the protection tree, and still have Greater Blessings of Kings while having that initial threat, which was such a problem for the Paladins. And you would see how in Zulgarub Paladins who were wielding, who were wielding Thunder Fury, uh, and still are wielding Thunder Fury, would go with a full Judgment 8 out of 8 set, which you are seeing right now me tanking this uh, incredibly sloppy stratum and um, what the 8 out of 8 piece does is its, its value is worth something like 100 ish 100 plus spell damage for the judgment and it would deal increased threat uh, because of the 8 out of 8 piece being additional damage so you would see that actually prove to be so good for instant threat for the paladins that it you wouldn't really believe how good it was so you get paladins move with full tier 2 then they would get thunder fury and then uh, they would just go into the holy shock build and they would have enough threat to sustain on the bosses not just 
just that they would deal actually significant amounts of damage as tanks. Uh, so much, in fact, that there were a few logs over here and there where protection paladins were out DPSing retribution paladins on a few boss fights. But you know, that's not uh, that's not a thing that happens all the time. It really is Thunder Fury uh, dependent. And if you wonder how good is really Thunder Fury on the paladin, I'll just take this small segment to explain. Well, Seal of Righteousness, uh, the the portion of it, the second holy portion of it, is really treated as a normal auto attack that procs everything inside the game in terms of weapon. It doesn't proc trinkets as far as we know, but it can double proc Thunder Fury. So it means that every time you swing, your auto attack can proc it, and the follow-up of Seal of Righteousness can proc it, and because Thunder Fury does not have an internal cooldown, at least I'm not aware that it has, then a Paladin would be able to double proc uh, Thunder Fury, resulting into incredible amounts of burst threat. So, with that being said, we cleared the air over uh, Thunder Fury. So, Zulgarub overall paladins were actually <laughs> really, really cool. Now, just to backtrack a little bit and Black and Clear thing that I forgot to mention, uh, paladins kind of were not good on Chromagus. So, uh, I myself, as much as uh, other fellow paladins, they were just uh, kind of, uh, you know, dispel, mo dispel, dispel bots. Sorry, they were, we were really dispel bots on that fight. Just, to, just uh, you know, giving a little bit of, uh, of thought onto that fight. And now, since we've solidified everything that happens in Zulgarub, obviously we get a few enchants here and there the, um, the paladin enchant for the helms and legs which is a tank enchant odd enough we get of course the spell damage here and there a few items um, overall the best ring uh, ring collection really for avoidance set piece but you get the idea Zulgarup is a really cool place to be as a paladin and we've we've down to Zulgarup in phase four and we're moving to phase five which is AK20 and of course Ankiraj, the Temple of Ankiraj, so the 40-man version. So here was the first time where Paladins really started to struggle. I myself found uh, this absolute thirst to go back to Ret, just because some of the fights were impossible to tank as a Paladin. Now, if you were going into the 20-man, we'll just cover the 20-man uh, really quick. If you were going into uh, the Ruins of Ankiraj, then you would see that, you know, you could still tank with the with uh, the same version of AQ20, but um, money-wise, you would have to, you know, move yourself from different builds in order to do tank, and it was just inadequate. It was just such a such a costly thing to respect three times a week. It's 150 gold, and then move back. It could be even 200 gold. You get the idea. And I myself found this need to go back to red, which I actually did. And to put it uh, plain and simple, I didn't progress AQ40 as a protection paladin. But I can tell you a few things from what I saw from my peers. And my peers were pretty much um, a little bit onto them. Eh, it can still be done, but... Uh, under a few conditions. So AQ AQ20 uh, is a silly is a silly dungeon. It's really tricky for paladins because uh, Kurinax is a, is just a major no no. You are really bubble dependent, and. Kurinax is just a huge issue for tanks, but it couldn't be done. Then you get the General, which was easy peasy to tank as a pal. Then Moam is impossible, like he drains your mana, you can't hold threat. It's just it's just a mess. Uh, Buru is a joke of a boss, we, we know how that goes. Um, IMS is, is, is a silly boss too, we get the idea. And Assyrian overall can be tanked by a paladin quite viably in fact. But, but you know, AQ20 is just a silly little raid, where mechanics are really the emphasis, it's not... Uh, individual performance more than the mechanics. And then we move into the AQ-40. So, um, Paladins would be uh, really good tanks for the uh, Thrash portion. Paladins would be really viable tanks for the majority of the bosses, including the Twin Emperors, which was a really cool discovery. And um, moving on to the very first boss, the Prophet, Paladins with the Holy Shock build would have enough fun over there. But overall speaking, Holy Shock build in AQ40 was a no-no. Things just dealt a lot of damage and you wouldn't really be able to sustain this particular playstyle. And not just that, your healers would say, hey man, you're too hard to heal. Can you move back to the old one? And you, you had to comply with that. So overall speaking, Protection Paladins in AQ40 were taking a huge beating because uh, even though the 2.5 set would be considered the best, even Bis Endgame as a, as a Paladin, you would still need to re-enchant that. 
and you would need to dedicate yourself a lot. Not just that, it is widely considered that a Paladin without Thunder Fury uh, suffers with threat. And that is 100% true. Thunder Fury is just such a huge threat item. Um, and Paladins would really think twice whether or not they want to tank AQ40. Now, by the end of AQ40, I move back into protection and I can tell you, uh, you could tank everything over there. Literally, you could tank everything. It's not an issue. It's not a threat issue uh, to that extent. But my raid was running 14 warriors and you get the idea. I don't need to think about threat when I get 14 warriors. In fact, I was building full on tank because I was taking quite a beating. But overall speaking, yeah, paladins could tank it, but only in the right uh, situation so aq40 is is done right we we get a lot of good gear from there a lot of items that we want uh the tier 2.5 set is there the kiraji bulwark is is there we get a really good uh you know glimpse of of, of damage as paladins not just that uh the Seal of Command one-hand build starts to really develop within the AQ-40 set. And we see how Paladins, uh, you know, if they, would, if they were to get full world buffs and go full attack power and crit, would actually go into the one-handed Seal of Command build, which doesn't use Consecration, because you don't use Consecration as a tank anyways, because the mana efficiency to threat uh, is just not good. It, in fact, it, it costs more mana than what threat it deals, even in the long run, once it's all done. So you, you would see Paladins really going for the slow to one-hander from, I think it was from Fancris, the Kiraji Ripper, I think it was, the 2.8 uh, sword. And you would see Paladins use that with a Seal of Command build, go purely strength whenever wherever they could, of course, don't neglect stamina and defense, and with the full world buffs, they would dish not just good uh, threats, but they would dish also uh, nice damage. So, overall, by the end of AQ40, this build started developing, and I've been using this build for years, for years, but nobody really uh, emphasized onto that, not myself included, uh, up until AQ40 started to... to, to pretty much deteriorates into the history of the phases. So with that being said, AK-40 is done and phase 6 with Nexramus began and this is where Palance just absolutely died. <laughs> there is no reason, trust me when I tell you, there is no reason for you to play a protection paladin in Nexramus. There is not a single fight that you are really valued for outside of Gluth because of, of how you threat, threat spam with kings just brings the skeletons to you. But overall speaking, um, you know, Paladins are a mess in Nextramus, but that is not because Paladins are bad, no. That is because the Dreadnought set is too broken for Warriors. Not just that, you know, Revenge is, is becoming a main source of threat from Warriors, not to mention that uh, most of the Warriors entering Nextramus have a Thunder Fury to begin with. So you get the idea, Warriors would get Dreadnought, and the moment they get the pieces, uh, they would just spank paladins threat all over the place you know paladins no longer are the threat kings not just that initial threat in in nextramus is really important so with that being said nextramus to summarize it is a hell for uh, retribution paladins the only sorry for protection paladins the only good thing about that place really is that you have the chance uh, to tank uh to tank Trash mobs, similar to the mobs before Patchwork, where you could just exorcism, it's a, it's a really good burst of threat, and you could hold that threat through the cleave process and the AoE process. So overall speaking, uh, it's fine to take the Protection Paladin, which main tanked and off-tanked throughout the entirety of the content before, into an extremis for the sake of you know paying tribute to the guy who really uh, was there for you. So overall speaking, I don't see any person really joining a Nextramus guild by saying, hey, I'm a prod pally, I want to come. You get you get what I mean? Um, so overall speaking, Nextramus is a terrible, terrible uh, experience for protection paladins. Um, even if you have enough of the same class of warriors or hell, paladins, mages, you name it, it's still not enough. Warriors just absolutely devastate in terms of defense, in terms of aggro, in terms of uh, avoidance even. They're, they're avoidance capped from the get-go, you get the idea. So overall, damage-wise, they're just kings. Um, so yes, this really is the uh, overview of the of, of the phases and how paladins really uh, were treated throughout phase one up until phase six. As I mean, protection paladins were treated throughout phase one and phase six. So you get the idea if. Uh, if you're looking to learn what happened, this was what happened with Protection Paladins. And 
to be fair with you, uh, looking at this survey, which, which where Blizzard really shot out to people, hey, would you like to get a few changes here and there into the game to make it better? And if they would change a few things for the Paladins, perhaps, you know, we could get a little bit more viability squeezed from that. But with that being said, protection is done. So let's move into Retribution all the way back into Phase 1. So, Red Paladins, what a joy that was in Phase 1. Let me tell you, I've never had more fun in my life, and I've played uh, Red on, on vanilla content and prods exclusively for what is to become eight years now. So, Phase... <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting really excited. Phase 1, holy moly, was it fun. I can't tell you how fun this really was. In, in Phase 1, we got this incredible... And I really mean incredible scenario where we power creep over content. And I'll tell you what I mean uh, in that. So dungeon-wise, Paladins were okay with damage. Like, Paladins don't struggle throughout any content phase, really, in dungeons. You, you don't need to even mention dungeons to begin with. But overall, let's talk about phase one that would be Molten Core and Anixia. So Molten Core Paladins were absolutely crazy. And the funniest part was the reaction to guilds whenever Paladins would craft Sulfurus and would power creep over content so hard to the point where Paladins were actually viable. In the first phase of World of Warcraft, where Molten Core is available, and exclusively it, you could make Sulfurus, which power creeps as a Nax weapon. It power creeps over AQ40, and it's actually a legit Nexramus weapon, of, of the quality of a Nexramus weapon. So you would see Reds pretty much go with Sulfurus, uh, take all the world buffs if possible, and then just do like 800 DPS single target fight, and people would like, hold on a minute, how the hell did you do that? I myself uh, did something along the lines of 750 uh, on one of the fights, and I, I spiked quite quite up high into the damage meters, and the guild was like, whoa, that Sulfurus does pack a hit, doesn't it? And I'm like, yes, it does! So you get the idea. It was so much fun. Phase 1 was a pleasure to play as a Red Paladin. Now, in Onyxia, Onyxia is the silly boss. It's not really a melee fight to begin with. You don't really care that much about Onyxia. It's just tank and spank stuff. So, uh, with that being said, let's finish phase, uh, phase 1, move into Phase 2, which was the PvP phase, really, with the Dharma and stuff and all of this. Um, now, I'm not sure if we had the Unstoppable Force Phase two or phase three i can't remember to be fair with you but um phase two wasn't really a focus uh for pvp for the red paladins just because the pve gear which dropped from uh from molten core was enough really and the pre-raid all of those things they were dealing more damage than the pvp set so you didn't really care that much about it so we're gonna skip phase two really quick and move into the phase three blackwing claire so blackwing claire was the first time where i felt oh, okay i'm back to normal and what i mean by that is well you know if you if you give the appropriate gear and everybody enters in an equal item level let's just call it like that uh, item level in quote unquote if we enter on the same level then you know paladins would still get a little bit back because see paladins don't scale well into this game and not just that if you give a warrior uh something that could, you know, like, uh, if you give Warrior, you know, the gear which Black and Claire has, then you would feel pretty much normal, like at the bottom of the list of the melees, as always, probably out DPSing half the casters, staying below Hunters, you know, it's always like that. So overall speaking, Black and Claire was still a, a process which I liked to raid in, because the fights are really good for all melees, and whenever you have a good melee fight, then you feel like, okay, I really want to play I really want to play here. So overall, Razor Gore was fun. Um, Vaust was, was a little bit of silly thing because, you know, mana is not really a thing that you go for as a paladin this early. You just pop a potion and the boss is dead uh, within the next time you empty your mana pool. So with that being said, Vaust was then you go into Broodlord, where, which no paladin really liked. Uh, you had to choose whether or not you want to stay in front of the boss uh, and possibly get one shot or get knocked back and try to parse with that. And then the loot tricks, which were absolutely horrible. Uh, Chromagus being a menace, where every paladin on Chromagus is just staying and spamming the spell cleanse while just white swinging the boss. And Nefarian, let me tell you, Nefarian. So, Nef was the first time where paladins really wanted to take some spell damage on them. And because of that, I, I myself, uh, being a red paladin, I got the majority of the tier 2 pieces actually quite fast. Within the first two raids, I got 5 pieces, so that's really good. 
um, outside of this, why Nefarian? Where, well, I can tell you that a single paladin with Holy Wrath, Goblin Sapper Charge, a Stratum Holy Water, and uh, soon into the next content phase with the Zandalari Hero Charm, although that's not a necessary uh, item that you need to have, would one-shot the entirety of the Skeleton Crew with the Sapper, with the Stratum Water, uh, and with Holy Wrath, and it would bring the entire raid into this position where, hold on, where's the skeletons? Where, where are the skeletons at? <laughs> so you would see paladins just cleaning the table for everybody, and it was a cool moment where, you know, people thought about, well, the paladins could have some uses here and there. So Nefarian was the place, in fact, where paladins would deal so much damage that they would be on first on the damage list up until the boss dies just because of the skeletons being absolutely wiped by one single player. So with that being said, uh, sorry, with that being said, Black and Claire was a pure, uh, pure taste of freedom for for Paladins. And um, we we we're cutting down to Black and Claire, and we're going obviously into phase three, which is sorry phase four, which is Zulgarub. And Zulgarub is a low scale raid where low scale classes would be expected to deal normal damage. And to be fair with you. Uh, yeah, Paladins were fine, Zulgarub was just a silly little place where nobody took world buffs to. And whenever you're a Paladin, you're, you're hardcore w just from the from the get-go, like you always want to be fully world buff whenever you go. So as Paladins would just, you know, deal good enough damage, but obviously not optimal. Um, not to mention that Zulgarub has only one item which you really would like to go for, and that's the Sacrificial Gauntlets. There isn't really much that you as a Paladin would care to, to get from there outside of the Enchant, obviously, from Exalted. And that's kind of the only reason for which Paladins attended to begin with. And, of course, the Zandalar Hero Charm, which I mentioned for, for the earlier um, earlier uh, Black and Claire Nefarian. So, with that being said, Phase 4 is kind of a eh phase for Paladins. You don't really care that much about it. So, let's move into Phase 5, which is the Ankiraj, obviously. And AQ-20 is still a mess. But, as I said, AQ-20 is a type of a silly mechanic raid where it's the mechanics over the individual skill of the player. So, with that being said... Mechanics were the center of it. You, you wouldn't be expected to deal a lot of damage. It was follow the mechanics and you'll kill the boss. It doesn't matter and anything else. You can't cheese anything in AQ20. And then we move, or, or maybe you could, but you get the idea. Then we move to the Temple of Ankiraj, which was where Reds really felt bad. <laughs> to put it at the least, Reds really felt bad. So, AQ40 is a really silly little raid for, the, for us paladins. Now, outside of us getting a set piece, uh, the tier 2.5, of course, which uh, wasn't as good as we wanted it to be, but at the very same time, it is good enough because it gives you the intellect, which allows you to sustain fights much more. And overall, being said, with that being said, you know, Paladins were excited to get the set. So there was this excitement about it. But once you get the set, uh, whose pieces nobody really contested over you, because the guild would rather give you those pieces first and then move to everybody else, then you get the idea. Like, there is nothing for you to look afterwards, except, of course, Hive Defilers, items that are heavily contested by otters. But to be fair, even with that said being in the game, uh, Palance would have to make the choice whether or not they want to keep on the AP crit version, which they were playing up until Blackwing Claire and Zulgarup ended with uh, no intellect almost everywhere on the pieces, and move to the set piece which would lock that, almost lock that, up until Nexramus uh, is over, or really just commit to the highly sought after warrior and rogue pieces and a few even hunters, would you believe that? Or just move to the 2.5 set, which was the easy the easy to get piece. And with that being said, Paladins were kind of divided. And the people who went with the pure AP crit red would be more rewarded than to the people that went with the hybrid. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. Overall, AQ40 was is, is, a, is a bad raid for Paladins, but it's a bad raid for every melee to begin with. So with that being said, AQ40 is a eh type of raid. And now let's talk about Nextramus. And... As similar to what Protection Paladins uh, were uh, were bringing to the table, Nextramus is the same thing for Reds. It's highly unfriendly. Um, you really depend on every single world buff to become, at the very least, relevant onto the meter. And with that being said, uh, it's just a bad... It just, it really, Nextramus is just a bad, uh, bad phase. It's a really bad raid for Reds and Prots. So with that being said, what, what makes it bad? What makes Red and Prots so bad in Nax? Well... See, uh, many people really uh, over 
overinflate the qualities and the damage, really. Not really qualities of exorcism. Uh, the qualities and properties are there, but the damage is not. So with that being said, uh, you know, it, exorcism is not enough. <laughs> It's just not enough, not to mention that it's still a, a, a mana thing that you can click and drain yourself faster. So you would see how exorcism would not be worth to be casted unless it's in the burst phases of your fight. And overall speaking, um, red and prot were bad, not because of of really the low damage. It would be so that you wouldn't be able to sustain the end of the fight no matter what you did. You would you would mana pot and you would use a rune and you would still get oom. So, with that being said, um, there was another way to go for it. And the players who dedicated themselves to play the, not the hybrid builds, which were really emphasizing onto intellect and spell damage and all of those things, then Red Paladins would actually go into the AP crit builds, which barely had any intellect on. They would just have pure attack power and crit, and they would actually perform uh, rather you know, better in some scenarios than the hybrid reds. So you would see that in the logs quite often. But overall, both of the performances were mediocre, so it wouldn't really matter. The outcome would be next to the same. So this was what happened in the World of Warcraft Classic, really. Anything. Everything that happened was over here with the protection and the retribution paladins. Now, just to give you a heads up, guys. I'm going to make a few videos sooner or later about, um, you know, theorizing over how how we could make things in different phases better, uh, you know, more suitable for Paladins. And it's going to be really a theory series, which I really enjoy making. After all, on this channel, all I do is nerd about protection Paladins. So with that being said, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. Look forward to these videos um, furthermore. And please subscribe and like, because this channel is my small love, uh, what can I say, my small love hub, where you guys are just a member of, and I feed you some love, I think. What am I even talking about? I'll just shut up from now. <laughs> so with that being said, my friends, thank you so, so much for, for, for stopping by. Share this with buddies. I would love to see what you guys think about Red and Prod. Have you ever played Red and Prod? Please tell me down uh, in the comments below. I, I'm not used to, to saying this, you know? I'm not used to saying... Tell that in the comments below. Good, good, send that in. Okay, I'm out. I'm out. See ya. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.